All of those who are teaching our kids today, thank you so much. In three years, we can teach a kid uh, the full gospel. And um, speaking of full, man, how about, how about oh, don't, don't leave. How about my girl Mandy today, huh? Yeah, yeah. You know, I just want to take a minute to give a shout out to her husband, who's really her better half. Wait, he might not see. We've got to scoot this way. Just Eric. He's on a plane. Oh, so no fire emoji? Okay. No, not today. Not sorry. today. I'm sorry to burst your... Okay. But if you guys don't know Mandy, uh, she's on the worship team so that you all can see that you do not have to be perfect to be a Christian. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I love her. She talks yeah. so much trash to me, but I love her so much. Thank you. You did a fantastic job today. Our worship team really just makes me feel bad about myself. Uh, because if you've ever heard me sing, as long as I never have to change range, pitch, tone, I don't even know what those things are, but I can hold one note like a pro. Soon as soon as we transition, it is straight 13-year-old going through puberty. I mean, it is, it's bad. And they make me feel, make me feel a little like a loser. Anybody in here ever feel like a loser? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's worse these days. Um, does anybody, y'all, y'all know what FOMO is? This, this is? this is a new thing, FOMO, the fear of missing out. You look through like a, a social media profile and you see that everyone has recently visited Morocco or whatever and, and you're just like, wow, I'm not doing anything with my life. And uh, the big one for me, this is like, I'm, I'm giving you guys, I'm being real with you today. Uh, the big one for me is like everyone's kid is a pro at something and I'm like wow I'm a horrible parent because I look at all of these all these posts and all these things that people are doing and I start to feel like a loser I'm like wow I haven't taught my kid how to be a go to the Olympics with a boomerang or whatever random thing that someone is doing and then do you ever have that epiphany that like dianoia this this moment where you go wait a minute I know this dude's kids. They're still in diapers. Like, what are you talking about going to the pros? It, you know, it's like, it's, it's unrealistic, but, but we start to get down on ourselves. We start to feel like a loser, right? Everybody's posting there. Anybody, do you unfriend people who constantly post their gym pictures? Anybody? You're just like, you know what? You are too healthy to be in my life. And that makes us feel like a loser, have you ever, have you, I, I've had this, I've had this, I'm telling, if y'all don't know, I had this, I had this journey, it's been like eight years, I lost 48 pounds, okay? Well, thanks. So, during that time, I still had TV, because you know, now you just pay like 37 subscriptions, because at first it was like, well, it's just cheaper, I'll just do Netflix and I'll cancel what, what do we have back then? Was it Prime Star? I don't even remember the name of all these 27 satellite dishes that are still on my house. But there were these things called infomercials, and you've never needed any of those things, but you've all watched one, haven't you? Did you ever see like, uh, like the P90X, Bowflex, Insanity? Have you ever done Insanity? Appropriately named. Did you see the infomercial and look at the before and after pictures and you're like, I'd be super happy to look like the before picture of this guy. (laughs) Does that not make you feel horrible? The whole goal of an infomercial is just to make you feel like the biggest lump of of human waste on your couch that they possibly can. We just, you just get down, right? And you start to feel like a loser. Well, congratulations, because none of you are. And God highly values you. Here's the thing. And I know, I know 48 pounds is, is not a big deal. But, but it was for me because there was, there was a, about 10 straight years of starting a diet every Monday just to fail. And that much failure really began to get to me. And until it became a, a spiritual issue for me. And I thought, you know what? If I want to quit something but I can't quit something, that means that something has mastery over me. It really became a spiritual issue. And so we'll talk about some of this in, in weeks to come. But this is the interesting thing. Do you know that, that 
the things that God put into motion in my life, He did long before I lost the weight that I wanted to lose. Did you know He valued me when I didn't value me? Do you know that wherever you are today, you are a child of God and He values you and He is setting things in motion and He is putting things in your life that He wants you to have. And so you may feel like a loser today, but you're not. You're a child of the King and He's got things set in motion for you. Now we gotta take those opportunities. We gotta grab onto these uh, situations, right? And, and, and there's gonna be some courage involved in us doing this and all these things. And you're gonna have to do that part, but you've gotta understand that He's not looking at you like you're looking at you. He doesn't see in your soul what you see in the mirror. God does not look at you and think, loser. Do you know why I know that? Because he created you. And I don't know if you're an artist, I don't know if you're a photographer, but I bet you've never set out a canvas and put it on your easel and got out your little Bob Ross painting kit and go, you know what, I'm going to try this, this is going to be crap. <laughs> you've never set out to do that. And God didn't do that with you. Ephesians 2.10 uh, Ephesians 2 says that, that God has a, a purpose for you, something before he created you. He told Jeremiah, when I, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. He knew you. And he, he set you in the right place in the right time with the right people, believe it or not. And God doesn't see what you see when you look in the mirror. Now, there's some things that we need to go win. That's not for today. I have one goal for today. Last week, I had one goal. Admit that you can't do it alone. That was our one goal. I hope you've chewed on that all week long. Today, I have one goal, and then we start the hard stuff later. I have one goal for you today. So this is not it. Don't worry. I'm not putting anybody on a diet today. That's just something that, like, like, this is my frame of reference, so that's what I'm speaking from. But it could be anything. You have something that makes you think. You have places you don't even like to pass that because that's a memory. You have a song that will make you turn off the radio because I don't want to hear that. That takes me to the reason why I'm a loser. And we all have those things. But God isn't looking at that. And when you can begin to look at yourself the way your heavenly Father looks at you, you will see something completely different. I'm not saying we're not responsible for ourselves. I'm not saying that some of us couldn't use a win for a little bit of a morale boost. I'm saying we'll get there later. Today I need you to understand that God is looking at you differently than you are looking at you. Long before I was proud that I had lost weight, started buying medium shirts, which I'm, I've blown that out of the water. We're back into L and looking at XL. But I, I'm, I'm buying these skin tight shirts and my wife's like, eh, you've lost some, but not that much. <laughs> but long before that happened, God already loved me. He was already putting things in my life. He was already putting things into motion. He was already teaching me. He was already like, um, I don't want to use the word caressing because it doesn't sound manly, but, but God was walking with me through all of my stuff long before I valued me. And he's walking with you. And if you don't value you, you're in your own boat because God is looking at you highly favorable. You are, uh, you are someone he is particularly fond of. You're not particularly fond of you, but he is. We can't be particularly fond of everyone. Let me ask you, how many of your kids are you fond of? I've got four, pretty fond of all four of them. He likes you. And this is why we're talking about what we're talking about today. Go with me to 1 Peter. I'm going to be in 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, we're going to walk through some things for the next few weeks. I'm really excited about it. This has been, if, if you think that I've been reading your journal, I haven't. This has been going for months. Uh, so, so I want you to go with me to 1 Peter if you have your Bible. If you don't have your Bible, that's okay. Nobody expected you to walk in here today as a Bible scholar. All the scripture will be on the screen, so, so don't worry about that part. We have that up here for you, and we have a Bible for you. As you exit today, we have one for you. It is free. It's a joy for us to give that to you. Please take one. We would be thrilled for you to take one. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Bible, there's an Old 
Old Testament and a New Testament. The Old Testament is God creating the world, uh, creating a people and promising that one day he would bring them a Savior, a Messiah. And the New Testament is when that Savior, that Messiah comes, and that was Jesus. And so we live under his authority, under his law. So this is, this is where we are. Now, Peter, who was the Peter who denied Jesus, but then like, because God is gracious, he's, he, he was, he was kind of the, the number one man, right? It, there, were, there were the 12 disciples, but this guy kind of led them because he was bold. Might not should have been in charge, but he was. Some of you can relate to that. First Peter 1, 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, okay, before we start, because of his great mercy, because we're getting into some good stuff, but it's not because we're awesome. It's because of his great mercy. Why are you good? Because of his great mercy. The Father loves you. Why? Because of his great mercy. Okay? Well, I haven't earned it. No, no, no. Because of his great mercy. Okay. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. I like that part. Anybody need new birth in here? Anybody need a redo, a do over, a new look at self? Anybody need a fresh start? That happens. Why? Not because you've deserved it, because of his mercy. Because of his mercy, he's given us a new birth into a living hope. And that is the only way you will get through our world is with hope. That is the only way you will get through our world is with hope. And so you might find yourself in a funk. It's January. We are in the thick of winter. Some days have not been told it is winter, but uh, we are in the, the middle of winter. The days are short. You're down on yourself. You feel like a loser. The world is kind of going crazy. You can't even watch the news anymore because, because you, you, you don't want to see it. And, and, and somebody on your social media feed is just blowing up life, and here you are stuck where you are. That's all a lie. But I feel down. And the only way that you will make it through is with God told us that there were things that he gave us that would last forever. And faith, hope, and love, those were not by chance. He wasn't just trying to create poetry and find something that rhymed. We've got to have hope. And because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. I become someone new, and I have hope for the future. I have hope for my life. I have hope for your life. Pastor, how can you do it? How can you do it every week? And you talk about all these topics and, and, and people come and they pour their problems out to you and you carry the weight of that. And how can you just be responsible for that? I'm not. I know the Bible. I give you the Bible. I give you the Savior. I'm not the Savior. I get that question all the time. And let me just stop you before you start. Does it weigh on me? It weighs on me because I love you, but not because I'm responsible. All I have for you is scripture. And that's all you need. All you need is the word. All you need is to be born again into a living hope. How can you be so confident? Because I have hope. I know that, that when you begin to follow Jesus, he's going to just wreck everything. He's going to change your life. You will follow the teachings of Jesus and you will not regret it. Anybody tried that? Is anybody, have, have you ran into anybody who goes, you know, I used, to, I used to just, whatever the Bible said, I would do it, and man, I regret doing that. It just was chaos. Have you ran into that yet? No, because his teachings are good, and he is good. It's not just the teaching. It's not just the principle. It's not just Confucius. This is, this is not Hammurabi's code. This is, this is supernatural. This is a living hope. This is someone who walks with you through your trials and comforts you. The closest you've ever been to God, let me guess, uh, the worst time of your life? Why? Because you were in a trial and you needed him and you reached out to a living hope and you had a living hope. You understand it's not just a hope. It's not just like, well, I hope one day. It's someone with me. It's a living hope that is supernatural pouring down into me and that's what I want for believers. That's what I want for you. You have someone who will walk with you and be in your heart. He will in, 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 infiltrate you. It says that the word of God will penetrate even to, to, to bone and marrow. Well, that's kind of weird. That's what holds you up without your skeleton. He's like, not just your frame, in your frame. I'm in you. I will be with you wherever you are, and I will bring hope to you. 
And so if you are down, there's one place to go, a living hope. There's nothing else like it. Now, there's good advice, and I read secular books, I read history, I do all of those things, but nothing replaces my living hope. I haven't found faith in anything else. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Uh, One more time. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A Christian is a follower of Jesus. And Jesus died. I don't know if anybody's told you that yet. I don't know. And, and I'm not hating on Joel Osteen or, 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 or any of the other people that you're watching on TV. Uh, but, but maybe if that's the only gospel you've ever had, you don't understand that Jesus died a horrible death and that all of his followers minus one were executed arrow to the or an arrow to the back spear to the back in india heads chopped off hung on a cross john was the only one who we think was not and they legend has it we don't know they they say that john was boiled alive but he didn't die and so then he was exiled so he was basically in prison uh, for the rest of his life not like he got off scot-free they died okay this is part that you've got to get because you're a jesus follower and so if you follow Jesus, I follow Jesus into his death. But then guess what Jesus did that nobody else has done? Jesus resurrected. I need you to understand today that before you can resurrect, before I can be reborn into this new and living hope and be something different, and all these other Christians seem to be getting something that I'm not getting, and Jesus just does it for them, but it doesn't seem to work to me. I'll go because they've got donuts, but whatever. I just don't get it out. I don't get it out of it, what they get out of it. That's because you haven't died yet. It's because you haven't died yet. And it's painful when you die. But you've got to die to yourself. Please don't commit suicide. I'm speaking metaphorically here. I've got to give over my own will, my own ambitions. I'm dead to self. That's what a baptism is. I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with him in death. And then I grab your arm, and some of y'all do this. I, I'm trying to get you to hold your nose. And I ba- it, buried with him in death. And then I hold you because I want you to think about dying. Raised to walk in newness of life, that was a symbol. I've died to myself. I want to do this. The Bible says I should do this. Well, this dude is dead. I'm following this. I've got to die before I can follow him into resurrection. If you want to follow Jesus into resurrection, into new life, into new birth, into a new hope, you've got to be dead with the old self. Now, I know that you're all distracted because you're like, that shirt. And you would, be, you would be on my wife's team. I've had this for years. You can see that there are creases in this shirt because it has not yet made it out of the closet. In fact, I just took the tags off of it only a little earlier. She said that this shirt would come in handy if ever in the same day I had to go from my position in a mariachi band to a redneck bowling league. And that is the only place this would ever be an appropriate shirt. But you will see a theme in the Bible. Did you see, you see how these buttons stagger? See, I bought this, and I, I was so proud of it. She just burst all my dreams. But you will see a theme in the Bible about taking off the old man and putting on the new man. And so... As you, as you mature in your walk, you will come to this, this moment. And you've had these moments, I know, because somebody has messed with you before and you've had to forgive them, right? And you forgave them. Were you surprised later when you found out that you hated them again? Isn't that weird? I thought I was over this. Well, you were that day. But forgiveness has to be renewed every day, right? And so the bad part of that is... I forgave, I went through the problem of that, but then I have to go through the emotions of that every day. It's a conscious decision, I have to forgive, right? 
Isn't that, isn't that the hard part of it? You know what the good part is? Yesterday, I was not so forgiving, but today, I get to choose, right? And God starts his mercy new every day. And so there's a theme in the Bible where it says that we take off the old man and we put on the new man. And some of you can, this is kind of, I mean, I love the shirt, so it's a bad analogy, but my wife hates it, so it works. Uh, we, we take off the old man because my wife is begging me, please, I don't like this version of you. You don't understand how it affects people. Your shirt is too loud. No one can hear what you're trying to say. And that's funny, but like the real version of what she doesn't like, that's the kind of man I'm trying to change, right? And so every day, I have to make a choice in the closet. Every day, I have to make a choice of who I'm going to follow. Am I going to follow Jesus today? Am I going to wear pearl snaps like a man? I'm not going to wear the shirt that I like, the version of me that my wife is begging me to get rid of. Am I going to be, am I going to be the me that, that, that isn't a good version of me? That's the easiest place to be. God says to take off the old man and put on the new man. Why? Because you can't be a new man until the old man is gone. Ladies, because of the analogy, I'm saying man... But you can't be a new you until the old you is gone. Until I die to self, I can't be a new person. I've got to die to some of my decisions, some of my things. And so for some of us, it's, it's an offensive choice. I'm not going here deep today. We're just surface. We're going to cover this in weeks to come. For some of us, it's an offensive choice. For some, we've got to play a little defense first. I don't want you to be thinking about, well, if I commit to Jesus, here's all the things that I've got to give up. I want you to be so committed to following Jesus that I don't have time for those things. I don't even have to think about being on defense because I'm on offense. I'm moving towards Jesus, so I don't have time for that. That's just in the way. We'll get to that later, but you've got to choose every day who you're going to be, what you're going to look like, what you're going to do. Am I going to die to self? Am I going to follow Jesus? We're not even through the first scripture yet. What have we got up there? Starting over on three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because of his great mercy. He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are supposed to die and rise again, and when you rise again, you rise into something that is imperishable. It cannot die. Nobody can take it from you. Well, our country is being threatened. Well, Christians were being persecuted, and they were still joining into Christianity by the thousands, watching their friends be, be wrapped and waxed and burned in Nero's garden so that his grapes wouldn't catch frost, watching them be burned in the street, executed, tortured in the Colosseum, and people are still signing up. Why? Because it's imperishable. You can't kill it. This is a hope that does not depend on my circumstances. My circumstances are affected by what I do. I'm not affected by my circumstances. I'm not a thermometer to gauge the temperature of the world. I'm a thermostat changing everything around me. Can I get an amen, somebody? You are supposed to be dead to self, raised with Jesus, and now you're a force to be reckoned with. Now you don't look in the mirror and see loser. You might need to go on a diet. You might need a haircut. You might need some of those things, but there's something so much deeper in you. Some of you are like, man, this is the best part of my week, and you like coming to church, and I love that. Some of you won't miss this because someone there is depending on me. I've invited someone to church. I've been ministering to somebody for weeks, and you're playing so offensively that there's no time for these other things. I don't have time to get stuck back into this sin. I don't have time to get a new master because God is doing something in somebody's life, and I can't wait for them to see what I see and have what I have because it's imperishable. It doesn't matter what's going on around me. 
Can we still get sad? Is there still seasonal effect disorder? Yes. The point in a Christian life is that you have to walk through it. That's why Jesus came as a man. He suffered all the things that we suffer to show us how to do it. He didn't take himself out of the fray. He put himself into it. And we will too. We will walk through hard times just like everybody else. And that's your platform. Because they'll watch you go through it and go, that's different. That should be falling apart right now, like I did. But they're not. Why? Because I have an imperishable inheritance. There's your prosperity gospel. Something that money can't buy. If you had unlimited money, you would spend it for peace. You don't have to buy it. Jesus gives it. What's the requirement? Die to self. Why am I not getting out of Christianity what other people are getting out of Christianity? Because it's all about you. It's not all about him. I've jumped into this to see if God can give me peace. No, that's not what he asked me. He asked me to die to myself. How do I know that? He said to follow him. Where did he go? <laughs> he died to self. He prayed in the garden before he was crucified on a cross. God, if it is your will, let this cup pass from me. What does that mean? What is that a metaphor for? I don't want to get crucified. I don't want to get nailed to a cross and speared through the side and sat there and, and, and just be tortured and killed in front of an entire city. I like to avoid that, but I die to self. If that's what you want, I'll do it. That's the example that he set. Reborn, living hope, new identity, a new look in the mirror, a new purpose, a new view for self, seeing your soul the way God sees your soul. I wish you could see you the way I see you. You think that you're a dumpster fire. You know what I, I, I see? Irreplaceable. I see that, that you, are, you are a soul that God values. And you are the only piece connecting someone to Jesus. And he's got so much for you to do. If you would stop comparing yourself to somebody's fake life on social media. Or stop looking at, at something outward or what, whatever. And value you just a little bit of the way that God does, man, you'd walk with so much confidence. This is free. This is free, okay? I'm just, I'm just going here for, for a moment. First John 1, 9. If I'm gonna die to self, if I gotta die to the old self, the first thing I have to do is know who the old self is. And you guys know that's the step. That's the first step in AA, right? is you have to admit. <laughs> I have to admit who the old self is that I want to die. And of all my years of doing ministry and all of my mentors, I, I, I don't know of anyone and I don't know of anyone who knows anyone that has died to a self that they've never admitted, that has died to a self that they've never confessed. And Jesus says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness that was free but you got to be willing to admit it before you can die from it. die to it quick example of what this looks like and i gotta rush through luke chapter 19 i'm gonna take you into a story of a man that you can identify with because he probably looked at himself in the mirror the same way that you do okay luke 19 1 through 9 let's let's get cracking he entered Jericho. This is Jesus. This is right before he goes into Jerusalem to die. In fact, he, he was going to Jerusalem, and he went through Jericho. He entered Jericho and was passing through. There was a man named Zacchaeus who was chief, uh, a, a chief tax collector, and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was not able because of the crowd since he was a short man. You think that bothered him? I bet it did, and I'll tell you why in a second. So running ahead, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus since he was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, 
Hurry and come down, because today it is necessary for me to stay at your house. So he quickly came down and welcomed him joyfully. All who saw it were pumped. They were like, really? You're going to love Zacchaeus? Good for you, Jesus. That's awesome. No. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. And I need to explain to you that Rome had come in and taken over Israel And so they allowed them some of their customs because the Jewish people were so hard to put up with that they were like, you know what, let's let them have their own religion, whatever, but we'll just have tax collectors. The way they did that, however, was not with Romans who would come in as a tax collector because I can evade a Roman, but I can't evade somebody who lives here and knows me. So they set up Jews to be tax collectors to the Jews. And how popular do you think that those people were? They were hated. Has the IRS ever called you before? (laughs) How nice were you? Now imagine that that was your friend from school. Traitor. They didn't think they should, should be taxed. Zacchaeus was a hated man. I wonder. I don't want to put anything in the Bible that's not there. But I wonder what kind of people take that job knowing that they're going to be hated. Maybe a man that's got a small man complex who's been picked on, who's been put down a little bit, and possibly is like, ha, 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 I'll get him. Maybe not. I don't know. I I don't want to put anything there that's not there, but this is what I know. Everybody draws around. Jesus is so popular, and he looks up in a tree, and he sees Zacchaeus, and he's like, come down. I'm going to your house, and they're like, oh my gosh. I cannot believe you would even hang out with Zacchaeus. They are ticked. Something's going on, and I might not not be, I I may not be hitting a nail on the head, but, but I'm somewhere close. So he quickly came down and welcomed him joyfully. All who saw it began to complain. He's gone to stay with a sinful man. But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor, Lord. And if I have extorted extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. Today salvation has come to this house, Jesus told him, because he too is a son of of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Hated man, and now he's saved. I'm skeptical. Why? Because we've all seen someone make that big move, right? Some of you have been saved 17 times, baptized eight, and like it didn't take. I'm skeptical. But Jesus said, he's saved, he's changed, it happened. How can he be so sure? Because it was obvious that Zacchaeus died to himself. The reason you become a tax collector is either for power or money, and there's a third option for power and money. And Zacchaeus has humbled himself And said, I'm not going to rip anybody off anymore. If I have, I'll pay him back four times as much. And I'm giving half of my possession to the poor. The old self of Zacchaeus was a money-hungry man. The new self of Zacchaeus is giving to the poor. He has had to die to himself to become someone that would give half of his income away. And I think that's how Jesus knew. Because you've died to yourself. He has a new identity. Zacchaeus is living on offense now. He's not living on defense. He's not trying to have to get back at everybody. You think Zacchaeus will rip anybody off again? I don't think he would. Because he met Jesus. And the goal is no longer money. The goal is Jesus. And there's a new and living hope that is in 
Zacchaeus. And it's going to get even stronger because when Jesus dies on that cross, he will, he will uh, be buried. He will raise back to life again in three days. But then he will ascend into heaven and the Holy Spirit will come on Zacchaeus. And I think that not only will Zacchaeus stop ripping people off, I think he will only get stronger on offense for the Holy Gospel, for the kingdom of God. Now, what does this look like for you? We're, we're going to start that next week. We're going to talk about how to do this. Next week, I start some of the hard questions, some of the hard asks. Today, I, I really only have one thing. Worship team, you can go ahead and come up. I'm going to give you one script, scripture and two questions. Are you all ready? Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure buried in a field that a man found and reburied. Then in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. There's a man who had possessions. He found a treasure in a field and he weighed the value of the treasure and he decided to go back and sell everything he had. His home, completely furnished. It's gone. Everything he had. You got oxen to plow with. You got a plow. You got land. What do you got? Gone. Why? Because he had seen the value of the treasure in the field, and he knew that he would sacrifice all of that to get all of this. And there's only one reason you would do that. Because this is greater than that. Maybe you have seen a treasure in following Jesus that you want. And the thing that's holding you back from taking part of this treasure is going home metaphorically and selling all that you have. Because the treasure of following Jesus and this eternal inheritance and imperishable hope is greater than everything else that I have. So here's my two questions. Question one is this. Is Jesus worth giving something up for? I know I ended a sentence in a preposition, but I don't know how to say, else to say it. Is Jesus worth giving something up for? That's a no-brainer, sure. Well, you're only halfway there. So here's the big question. This is what we're chewing on till next week. Thank you, those of you who are joining us online. Pumped that you're here. I hope that you're healthy enough to be with us next week. If not, we'll see you online. But this is a question I want you to chew on. Is Jesus worth giving everything up for? He wants it all. So much so if it stands in the way, it's got to go. And that hurts. The man who found the treasure in the field sold everything. You know there was something that he was proud of, something that had sentimental value, something he had worked hard to attain. Is the new treasure worth everything or not? Because my job is to tell you <laughs> both parts. Here's what you'll have to give up, and here's all that you'll get. That you've never gotten this part, probably because you've never sold that part. I believe with all my heart that he's worth everything. And that sounds good, sitting in the grand building on a Sunday morning. But I want you to chew on it all week because that is the only way is to die to self follow Jesus into the new and living hope. It is brutal. 
God's going to ask you to go through some brutal things and the outcome will be beautiful. Brutiful. You can credit me for that. But please don't because I stole it. Is Jesus worth giving up everything? I'm going to pray for you. Uh, but before I do, when I pray, some people are going to come up here. They've got baskets, and uh, they're going to pass them around. So if you're a believer, part of the way that we worship is with our tithe and offering. So that's the appropriate place to do that. Uh, but also, and our kids are serving today. Haven't they done a fantastic job? They made you coffee and handed you donuts, and now they're taking you money. But you got a connection card coming in. If you will fill that out, this would be the, pre, uh, the, the, the correct place to, to put that. Uh, we will get those. Uh, we want to give you a call, email, text, whatever. We want to walk with you. If you're walking through it, we want to walk with you. Uh, better yet, if you don't want to fill that out and you want to come speak with us after service, please come do that. It is our, it is our joy. We love you and we want to speak with you. So please come uh, speak to us after service. But I really am asking you, if you've got to write it on your hand with a pen that should be in your seat, whatever it is, will you chew on that one question? Is he worth it? And don't give me, don't give me that Sunday school answer that's not been thought through, please. That will not hold up in hard times. Jesus, I pray for your, your people. God, that they will truly uh, consider you. and God, that you will... Um, you will show us anything that we've not gotten rid of, God. Any part of us that, that is not dead yet, God, we give you everything, Lord. I pray you would just resonate. Holy Spirit, we invite you just to uh, rebuke and correct and train and, uh, and just, just have your way with us, Father. Teach us this week as we do things. Stand in the way of getting closer to you, God. I pray that you will point that out that you will show us. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Please stand and worship with us.